problem is there's always an inclination to offer people free stuff so that either they can vote for you or if there's some corporations they'll give you campaign finance and things like that but where's the selling or oh, we want to give you less stuff I'm used to getting this stuff I've not planned for my life to have to provide this for myself because I've always got it for free and now I don't know what to do so it's also kind of immoral to get benefits in the here and now and then expect your progeny to or other people's progeny to kind of take up the consequences of that. The government can create jobs actually, well it can create jobs but it's all it's never done in a vacuum. There's always a bunch of Whatever way you use to do it, there's always a bunch of unintended consequences like a string of dominoes flipping down one after the other. This is like a, a, the motor of a car, you know, an economy. All of the parts are interrelated to anything else. The main thing that you want in life is options because when you have options, you're in a strong bargaining position. When you have fewer options, you can't advocate for yourself. When you've got someone in the government making laws for everyone on what kind of workplace safety they have to have at the workplace, how do they know whether it's worth the investment or not? The person who owns that factory can see, you know, what are the risks here? Am I gonna have to pay out settlements and things like that? How much do my staff want these safety things? Um, would they rather have a pay rise or would we rather introduce these and most workplace safety accidents are um, by human error so you've basically forced people to invest in a bunch of equipment that they don't even need that they could be pay paying their staff with it doesn't make any difference to the employer whether I give you a pension whether I give you a higher wage whether I give you more workplace safeties whether I get a, a nice fountain that you can all congregate beside and have your coffee a break. It's all the same to me as an employer. I've got a certain amount of money to spend. It's in a free market where you can walk in and out of a job, you're going to get roughly the kind of deal that you want for your wages. Roughly, not exactly, because a lot of people are involved. But that's, that's how it tends to be, and this was evidenced by an uh, economist called Benjamin Powell who went to the third world and you know, asked them in these sweatshops, which by the way, a lot of people would, well, everyone there would rather work than the other options because they were getting paid three to six times what they would get be, be usually getting paid if they weren't in the sweatshops. Would you like better, more time off? Would you like better workplace safety? Would you like this? Would you like that? Of course they said yes to everything. Who wouldn't? But when they said, would you like that? Or the amount of a dis decrease in the wage that you would have to incur in order to pay for it, they almost always said no. That, that, that's the thing. There's no free ride in economics. Everything comes at the expense of everything else. It's the nature of the universe. I'm here having a talk with you guys. That means that I can't be, um, I don't know, surfing or something else. But I get more value from this than I, I don't know how to do that. It sounds hard, it sounds boring. I'd rather be hanging out with you guys because I only get to do this once in a while. But you guys are listening to me. You might very well be rather uh, having a coffee next door because I'm boring as hell. But you still prefer to stay here because you're too polite. You're too polite. You value staying more than you value leaving. Healthcare in, a, in an ideal world should be less expensive every year. Why? Because people are getting less sick. In a sane system, you would incentivize healthy lifestyles and then obviously there's some things that you just can't help. You get a broken leg, you can get insurance for that. Without being able to compare services across the economy, you don't know who's doing a good job of what and who's doing a bad job of what. And if they're doing a bad job, you're still forced to pay for it. I mean, this is what really frustrates me about statism. How smart do you need to be to know? If I offer you a service that 
you have to pay for whether you like it or not. And not only that, but I'm the only person allowed to provide that service. No one else is allowed to. I can make it illegal for other people. How intelligent do you need to know that you're going to get a pretty terrible service? And America spends more on healthcare per head than any other country. Um, but just because it's a private system doesn't mean it's a free market system. You're not allowed to build hospitals without going in front of a committee to justify building a hospital. And the people on the board of the committee are going to include people from the hospital that already exists. You're not allowed to buy insurance from a state other than your own, which means that people can't compete on the price of insurance. And 50% of the spending on healthcare in America is the government. So there, we know it's not a free market system already if the government's doing half the spending. Um, so the thing is, when you have a restriction in the supply of services, you will always have um, high prices, but we can't say that the American, the, 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 the system in America is terrible, and I'm not going to stand here and defend it, but it's not without some advantages over other systems. For example, almost all the great breakthroughs and inventions in healthcare come out of the so-called private system in the US. That means that countries like ours and Denmark, you know, they use a lot of American technology. They can have their socialized service because they benefit from innovations made in America's private system. If they go full single payer, the whole world will lose from the innovations that are coming out of America, not just Americans. And you know, the the you can you can go in the next day to get an operation in America for an operation you might be in a waiting list here or in Canada for. People come from Canada to pay for healthcare in America because you can get in the next day. People have said in Canada they can get a CAT scan for their cat faster than they can get one in, uh, on the National Health Service. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT No Gov License allows use or modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Peaceful Anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT No Government License. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at bipcot.org. So today I am pleased to have Anthony Samaroff coming in from Scotland. He's a voluntarist and libertarian. He runs the Scottish Liberty Podcast with his partner. Uh, um, and you can find that on Facebook and YouTube under Scottish Liberty Podcast and on Twitter at Scottish Lib Pod, P-O-D. And uh, his website, his, uh, his blog, Seeing Not Seen, S-E-E-I-N-G, Not Seen, S-E-E-N, dot blogspot, dot C-O, dot U-K. And then you can also pick up his free ebook, under www.antonysamaroff.com. So Anthony without the H, Samaroff, S-A-M-M-E-R-O-F-F.com. And pick up your free ebook, which is Common Misconceptions About Capitalism Debunked. And we will be discussing that in addition to quick history about how he came to volunteerism and how uh, his podcast got started. So um, Anthony, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Good to be here with you. Yeah, no problem. I first heard of you uh, from through the Tom Wood Show, and uh, right. it was an awesome uh, interview. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think you had a lot of great things to say, and I'm like, I, I like, I like the way this guy talks. I want to get him on my show. <laughs> so, <laughs> Lovely. So, so I'm glad we finally got it. Uh, yeah, go, got it going, got it done. Uh, so please, before we get into um, any of those wonderful things, please uh, get into a little bit about your history. And then we'll uh, we'll pick up with the present. Okie dokes. Well, like most people, young people living in Scotland, I considered myself on the left of centre. 
but I was always a knowledge seeker and a uh, um, free thinker, and I was always on the internet trying to find the truth. And um, when the Re Ron Paul revolution came around about 2007, I was already posting videos on the internet about politics, but I was coming from a sort of liberal, or what you'd call a progressive position, although we don't really use that term in the UK. And uh, the libertarians start gate crashing my YouTube channel and telling me that I was wrong and that I should watch this video and that video. And I uh, rolled, uh, followed the rabbit hole down into the center of the earth <laughs> and uh, over the course of a couple of years I had to let go of all my misconceptions about capitalism my ebook my free ebook is called common misconceptual common misconceptions about capitalism debunked um, which as uh, you've heard you can get at antonysamroff.com and uh, I had to give up all my misconceptions about capitalism one by one and uh, discover the truth and I abandon my political positions and find a new new ones. So it wasn't a wake up moment, it was a gradual deconditioning of the mind and I became a, an anarchist or a voluntarist and um, yeah, I, I felt like that was the, the correct, consistent, logical, moral position and um, I, I hold it to this day. Yeah, that's beautiful. One thing I often... Uh tell people is I admire uh, voluntarists and anarchists because most of us were not raised as voluntarists or libertarians. Mm. And so as a result of that, you know, we had to question many of our preconceived notions about, about business, about the economy, about morality, about the state. And in order to do so requires an extraordinary amount of humility, right? To, mm -hmm. to say that what I believed for the most of my life may have been wrong and and most yeah. people are not mature enough to admit that <laughs> yeah it's it's always a surprise to me how difficult it is for people to change their opinions on things i've maybe always i've not always known the truth about things but i've always been open to reason and um you know when people said things that i didn't know that contradicted what i believe i was usually like oh like um it always piqued my interest and I, I wanted to know the truth. I don't know what creates a truth seeker, but <laughs> um, but for whatever reason, it's it's always been something that I, I valued the truth more than my opinions, you know, so sometimes didn't, didn't change my mind there and then, needed a lot of convincing, mm. but I was open to being convinced. In fact, I wrote an article for the site Waking Times called How to Change Someone's Mind, which if you've been engaging in any debates, it's definitely worth Googling. Um, I've got a lot of positive feedback on that article. Hmm, cool. Yeah, definitely. That's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, it really amazes me how, you know, the, the lengths to which people go to search for, you know, what we would consider the truth, you know, it's like, is, is, that, is that a destination or is that a... Is that a um, you know a, a process? You know, it's it's a mm. it's a slow um, mm. enlightening. You know, and it's constantly mm -hmm. happening. We're still discovering. We're still learning constantly. Sure. You know, go ahead. Yeah, no, I can't agree with you more. I don't think I even even though I've been a libertarian for coming up to ten years, I don't think I had the understanding of that I do now. Even a year or two ago, it's like. You can go down this rabbit hole forever. There's always something more to learn. There's always a wider angle view where you understand this reality better from, you know, and it, it, it's hard, hard for some people because it takes dedication to fully understand things. Everyone likes um, quick answers, and I've provided some quick answers in my book, but... Um, even though they're quick answers, they, they might have taken many years to arrive at such clarity because uh, wisdom is like the product you get for the investment of time. You know, you really need to, things are complicated, things cannot, are interconnected. And when you want to explain a concept to someone else, it's like uh, IKEA furniture, you know, they're going to 
they're only going to hear your words. So you've got a concept in your head that's like a spider web and you need to flat pack it (laughs) and translate it to them. And then they need to rebuild those concepts in their own head, you know, like the, like the Ikea furniture. So that is the challenge with, um, influencing people's opinions because they already have, uh, their, their, model of the world and you're trying to influence them into accepting a more accurate model than the one that they have hopefully and also while being open-minded that may you know maybe parts of their maybe they've modeled parts of the world more accurately than you have right 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 and uh and my my approach most of the time when i talk to people about this stuff is is it's less about telling them what they should believe sure. and it's more about just being curious about why they think what they think asking yes. questions that helps a lot if you can ask someone why they believe what they believe or how they came to that position then even listening to that with curiosity and um, demonstrating your understanding of how they see the world will make them more open minded to what you have to say Oh yeah, definitely. So please um, get into how your uh, and when your uh, Scottish Liberty podcast uh, first began. Well, we just enjoyed our first birthday not very long ago, and um, I guess when I was online looking to see if there was anything libertarian in Scotland, and there was, I was amazed to find there was a Scottish Libertarians group on Facebook, and I started going up to meetups and. Uh, at first, there was, there was really often only three or four of us at these meetings uh, in Edinburgh. I was living at the time, Edinburgh, Scotland. And um, I still go to those meetings monthly. I'm staying in Glasgow at the moment, which is where I was born. But sometimes I go through to the Edinburgh ones. And they've really come along. You know, sometimes we get um, six to ten people at each and they're different people, um, some of them. So so the, the – and sometimes – sometimes surprise ourselves with more than that. So there's a little bit of a community here in Scotland now of libertarians. And through that community, I met my collaborator. I'd wanted to do a podcast of my own for a long time, but really I'm a team player. I'm not so great at doing things on my own as I am in collaboration. So we are both knowledge of ours. We we just love learning (laughs) and we've done that our whole life. So we get to share the best of what we've learned on, on our podcast. Podcast. We're told it's funny. People really like the uh, relationship between him and I because he's he's more aggressive and I'm more softly spoken. <laughs> uh, but sometimes we sometimes we switch and he he um, expounds on a topic and and I have a rant as well. And uh, I definitely recommend anyone who's got time in between listening to Peaceful Anarchism podcast <laughs> check out the Scottish Liberty podcast. It's a good one. Out of the ones that are out there, I definitely rate it highly. Uh, even though I'm sure I'm prejudiced, I think that <laughs> if it wasn't my show, I would listen to it for sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I listened to a few episodes after I heard you on the Tom Woods show, and uh, and I definitely enjoyed it. Uh, I think one on the environment, one to talk about the poor. Um and and I love to me um my personal favorite in podcasts is learning about theory. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not so much interested in current events or what this president sure. said or laws or specific taxes. I just want to learn theory and more and economics and I guess I'm a yeah. more philosophically minded guy. Sure, and I, I do quite a lot on economics in this show. We do um we sometimes break down current events, but we tend to bring the principles in. And what I like to do on my show is try and squeeze a lot of points into a short space of time uh, and evidence, not like in a rush way, Mm. but so that you don't just tackle an issue from one angle, but from many angles so that people can get, as I say, you're trying to help people model the world better. So I would like people to come away from our show thinking that they understand an issue from from many angles and not just you know the basic ones you you you, like for example if you read an article on minimum wage they usually make the same arguments oh it's going to cause unemployment or and that this and that but um say 
I, if we were to tackle that issue, I'd want to use arguments that maybe people don't hear as, as much, like say, well, when you take into account the acute, the accumulative effect of their minimum wage, so you've got someone in a factory and then someone driving a truck and then someone in the shop, you don't know how many people from one start to the end uh, are getting a pay rise and when all of that is factored in the end product is going to be more expensive and the people who are most going to be affected by that are people on low who are on the minimum wage because more of their disposable income goes on that kind of thing i'm not saying that's like a revolutionary argument or anything like that but i could probably think of several more that you and, and i i tire of media when people say the same arguments over and over again like I like to to take a wide angle view and get a full picture. Um, on the Scottish Libertarians website, there's an article that I wrote. You should probably turn it into a podcast at some point called uh, "Living Wage: The Road to Hell Is Paved with Good Intentions," mm. and that's the best article I've seen on the topic. Otherwise, I wouldn't have spent the time to read it. And the reason why it's good is because it tackles it from many angles. Similarly, with our episode on the environment called Only Capitalism Can Save the Planet, Socialism Will Destroy the Earth, I tried to fit many, many articles on environment, uh, many arguments on environmentalism into that. So, yeah, check it out. See if you like it. If you like it, great. If you If you don't get into something you do like... Yeah, yeah, I definitely suggest um, any any of our listeners to definitely check it out because I think you guys offer, like you said, fresh insight. Um, and mm. and it's also it's such a beautiful thing, you know, when I see um, various groups pop up all over the world. You know, like I see, mm. you know, volunteers in India, volunteers in Pakistan, wow. anarcho capitalists in Australia. You know, and you guys, Scottish libertarians, it's so beautiful to see all over the world. And, and you know, in Brazil, there's and in Cuba, you know, in Cuba, there's a mm. there's a libertarian institute which is which is terribly persecuted at the moment. But mm-hmm. but it's just amazing, and it's very inspiring to me to see that that all over the world people yes. are embracing these concepts. Yes, and I hope uh, faster and faster. Now we are at a stage where there's a lot more media than when you or I became a volunteerist. So uh, it should be easier and easier to make the case. One thing that I recommend is that people buy, uh, sorry, download my free book. Um, and one of the reasons is if you get into Facebook debates and you're tired of answering the same questions over and over again, you can copy and paste a ready-made answer from my book to move the conversation ahead a step. And then when they respond to that argument that you've made, that you've heard a hundred times, you're one step forward in the conversation. You know, you don't, you know, you, you, you can skip stage one. Yes, yes. Let's get into your book. Definitely. Um, Common Misconceptions About Capitalism Debunked is, uh, is your free ebook. And, uh, and you really laid some of these commonly um, stated uh, misconceptions very nicely. So, so yeah, please uh, discuss the book and, and maybe get into some of your favorite uh, topics. Yeah, I'm really excited about the book. It's been out for quite a while and the feedback that I've got is great. You know, people really like it. It's very short. You can probably read it in an hour. But um, it just... The answers that I give are simple, but they were not arrived at quickly. As I say, as you go down this journey, you get a broader and broader view, and it takes some time to distill that broad view into sh- you know short answers, but they're meaningful because these are literally the concerns that people have about capitalism, and they're mostly based on misconceptions. So... You know, you can if you've got any left wing friends that are curious, this is a great ebook to just email them. It won't take them long to read and they'll enjoy it, uh, I think. And and it'll also help them have a more advanced conversation with you because they'll be like, right, I see where you're coming from, even though I don't really disagree. Uh, even though I don't really agree, and it's just it's just designed to move the conversation forward a little bit, so we're not always having to. Uh, answer the same things you know and um, one of my favorites is you know ca- well capitalism is a system of competition that's simply not the case you know S- capitalism is just a system of the voluntary exchange of goods and services some competition might arise out of that but that's only because 
going to happen whenever there's a choice. So, you know, if I was invited to speak to you this evening and I also had another speaking engagement offer, I should be so lucky. I would be in a situation of scarcity. I'd have to choose between um, podcasting with you or the other guy and maybe we could arrange to speak another time. But that doesn't mean that um, whatever... Well, that's maybe not the best... uh, um, example, but let's say it was a dinner offer. That doesn't mean that friendship is a system of competition because I can't go out and see honor both uh, dinner offers at the same time. It's just simply um, this would exist in any system, even in a centrally planned economy, because resources are scarce. If I was a filmmaker and someone else was a filmmaker, people can't watch both our films at the same time. So this is just really largely used to um, associate capitalism with tooth and nail and it's every man for himself when actually capitalism is really about voluntary corporation and um, we're voluntarists why because when we interact in a voluntary way we both benefit from that whether it's an exchange if I swap your tie for a pen uh, you prefer the tie I prefer the pen we're both better off or an exchange of ideas Hopefully, the reason why we're having this conversation is we both feel like in some way it benefits for us mutually. And um, this is the thing, you know, we, I think if we're to get any mileage, we need to make the, the humanitarian case for capitalism. Um, as a huge an admirer of Ayn Rand, for example, I am, um, you need to know the um, psyche of the people that you're dealing with and... Um, address their concerns, not what you think should, ought to be their concerns. Yeah, yeah, definitely, uh, de- definitely agree. You know, the idea that uh, you know, like you said, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a cutthroat competition. Every mm-hmm. man for himself. It's, it's so ridiculous. It's like, I, and I love that idea of win-win. You know, it, it's mm-hmm. it, it, the the transaction only occurs when both parties consent. That is the essence, sure. the essence of capitalism, right there. You know, and and that's why you know when uh, when businesses are created, wealth is wealth is created, right? Because they sure. can only become prosperous by offering a product or service that makes other people's lives better. Why would yes. people buy a product that makes them yes. worse? <laughs> well, I mean, some people obviously do uh, for uh, human. Uh, foibles, whether right, it's, right. you know, you know, I haven't, I haven't completely uh, disavowed myself of the vice of smoking, but uh-huh. I, you know, I still, I still enjoy that from time to time, and um, you know, I, I'm making a choice with my resources of, of, um, of, of what I want to do, and if you don't give people that freedom to make bad decisions as well as good, um, then you've got a situation where you treat people as children. And uh, you know the, the the freedom of choice is not is not respected. Uh, so what 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 works about the free market is people rarely make the same poor decision twice. You know we have this idea that um, well we don't have this idea, but many people have the idea that um, a market can't. Uh, you know, without without government intervention into the market, uh, you know, people will be dying of poisonous, toxic products. But you know, uh, actually, most of the regulations cause problems because small businesses can't cope with the expense; they can't afford lawyers and actuaries. Uh, whereas the big corporations can afford to lobby to get more and more regulations. And that means that people have less choice over the the number of products at their disposal. You know, in the US, there's over 800 occupations that might require a license in some states. Well, if they have to go and train to get a license, that means that the price of that product is going to be higher. Uh, poor people aren't going to be uh, able to afford it. I mean, I've got an article on my blog on occupational licenses, and I talk about some of the ways that the market's able to re- regulate itself. First of all, consumers provide a large degree of regulation because they don't buy per services again and again, and they rant about services they think are good, and they rant about ones that they think they're bad. And um, people can put 
together consumer watchdogs and you get magazines and things like that that review products and compare them. Employers don't want to employ a poorly qualified civil engineer or a plastic surgeon. So there's employer discretion. Then there's other ways that can emerge in a free market, especially if people think, well, the government's not regulating that. They're going to want to know that people are registered with a bona fide um, watchdogs or, or they can be privately certified. And then even... Um, there's already, without regulation, there's the law says that you have certain protections against faulty products or dangerous products. Um, so that uh, that provides a form of regulation. And then, you know, people can engage in contracts. And then bonding, they can agree in advance uh, to with third parties to ensure that payment's transferred when it's supposed to. Um, consumers can take out insurance and obviously as a last resort there's the fallback position of the legal system in jail for for bad actors so oh, oh, there's all sorts of what people think is regulation is 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 not limited to what the government does right the word regulation means to regularize something so it's actually a rhetorical ploy <laughs> that statists call government regulations, regulations, because you're assuming that the government regulation is going to regularize things. Well, it might not. It might create unintended consequences. So so it's, it's a really an unfair term. Yeah, yeah. And, and the, for me, the, the amusing part of it is like, like so the, you know, uh, drugs are illegal, right? Hallucinogens or marijuana, right. or th things like that are illegal. And, and so people look at uh, drug cartels and gangs engage in violence, I guess, because of of uh, territory and you know trying to trying to transport their product uh, in in uh, and the danger that they have to endure because it's illegal. And mm -hmm. then they say, "Look, you see, that's that's because of the drugs. They're bad. They're they're dangerous." You know, and then the idea is like, "No, actually, they're not the problem. It's really the state. The state is the most dangerous thing about the whole sure. drug thing." <laughs> Yeah, you know? yeah, and and you know what's dangerous? Putting someone in jail right. for uh, for smoking a plant. Do you know what a hum humongous expense? And uh, um, you know, there's it's an interesting thing about drugs. I just wanted to share this piece of information because I only learned it recently. Um, there's this conception that if you grab someone and injected them in her with heroin for two weeks, please don't, that they'd automatically become an addict. But actually, it turns out for across all substances, it's only something like 10% of people who are actually susceptible to addiction. So, you know, I, I mentioned before that I'm a casual smoker. But, you know, I was in India at the beginning of the year and I didn't have a cigarette for five weeks. I don't have a particularly addictive personality. You know, I can go without these things, um, whereas other people can't stop. You know, and it's people who have a certain kind of psychological profile that are vulnerable to addiction, whether it's gambling or sex or drugs. And, you know, those per people deserve a compassion. And with a system that's not wasting money, throwing people in jail, you you know, you can have charities cropping up who give people safe spaces to. <laughs> sorry, I know that some people are triggered by the term safe spaces, but I meant safe places <laughs> to. um to use drugs in an environment where they'll be overlooked by doctors. And when they've tried this in some countries in Europe, a large percentage of heroin addicts, when they didn't have the additional stress of wondering if they were ever going to get a hit again, just simply stopped using after a while. Um, so, you know, we want to make these things safe. And, um, and you know, this is one thing, you know, if government had not banned drugs for 50 years or more, that would have been like 50 years of research by companies and how to lower the side effects and improve the drugs while making them safer. Do you know what I mean? We've lost out on that research. Some of the best pharmacists in the world work for the illegal drugs industry in, in um, Amsterdam. You know, mm -hmm. we could have, you know, we want them to be safe. Uh, so that's my, my, yeah, that's what, what you said sparked. So it's an interesting topic. Um, so, 
Go on, please. No, no, I was just going to say that uh, the, the other thing that, that uh, prohibition does is is make it more dangerous in the sense that, like, during during uh, alcohol prohibition, you know, in order to, because it was so dangerous to transport alcohol, they they um, concentrated it and made it more potent and more dangerous. Right. Right? So, so right. it seems like a similar thing right. is happening with with drugs and hallucinogens and entheogens is that they become more potent once, once they become um, on prohibition. Right. Right. Yes, that would make sense because then you can transfer transfer a, um, a smaller volume, but uh, get more people that are high. Right. Right. Definitely. So, um, so then you you talk about let's see, selfishness, profits. Maybe go into profits. I like talking about that. <laughs> right. Profits. Well, my view is. We all try and profit from everything we do. It's just how we're wired up. And that could be anything. That could be an enjoying a conversation. Even if you're not enjoying the conversation, you stay in it because you're polite. Okay, well, you deem by your values that you're going to profit more from not offending the other person than by telling them that you're bored. Um, this is not what's going on, by the way, right now. I'm very much enjoying our conversation. Um, so... There's a prejudice against profits uh, that are of a financial concern. And there's this view that workers are, that capitalists are just skimming profits off the top. Most companies make a profit margin of 8 to 12%. It's not huge. Um, but just people think that's capitalist is skimming that 12% of the top. Of course, if you understand economics, you know if that was true then the capitalists would be out of a job because if they were just providing no value and skimming that off the top, someone would come in with a non-profit organization and undercut them by that 8 to 12 percent and offer a cheaper product. So the capitalists might, must be providing some value and uh, that, that there's, there's various values that he's providing. One is he's, every, he's the last person to get paid. So he's paying people for the privilege of knowing where their wage is coming from and also um, uh, for not having to wait. They get paid right away. He gets paid last only if the product's successful. But the most important thing is that profits are a signal. They tell producers what we need more of and what we don't. If, if a company is running a huge profit margin, that's a signal to tell other producers, make more of that stuff. People want it. There's uh, there's uh, there's not as, enough, as much supply as there is demand, and by the same token, a lack of profits is to indicate that there's not a demand for this. So you know, in countries where they don't run profit and loss, uh, where they've tried to centrally plan the economy, there's always massive overproduction and waste of things, and then on the other hand, there is underproduction, and many times whenever the government's been in charge of food production, for example, million, you know, hundreds of thousands of people have starved to death. So it's very dangerous. It's very dangerous to 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 um, try and do away with this signal, this um, uh, profit and loss mechanism, which tells people what to produce and what not to produce. People worry that the poor will not get access to services, but the market has an amazing way of making services that were not available to the poor, available to the poor over time, such as the laptops that we're recording this interview in. You know, um, uh, so most people who got really rich got really rich by making products that were formerly expensive affordable because the more people that can buy your product great you know and um, so yeah i guess that's what i've got to say about profits yeah yeah what you reminded me of was um you know the, the pricing mechanism as it gets destroyed in, in socialist economies like venezuela like cuba and like the soviet union and and like you said, how the result is, uh, and also communist China, say for example, <laughs> millions of people starve, right? Because you don't have that feedback mechanism between consumer and producer, and you know letting them know what the market needs more of, right? Because it's such an intricate, complicated, um, you know, lattice work. It's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> yes, yes. As you know, no one has the information to centrally plan an right. economy. Um, as you know, Hayek was very passionate about demonstrating in his essays that 
information is distributed amongst all of us. So there's no way that you can sit in the center and accurately um, anticipate what people need and want. The great thing about the market is people can try lots of different ideas and uh, at the same time. And the successful ones will attract profits and be able to expand their operations to serve more people. And the ideas that people don't like, yeah, well, maybe they weren't well publicized. But, um, you know, if, if, if someone has a good idea and, and they don't manage to sell it that well, then, you know, they weren't the person to take the idea, idea to its fruition. And, you know, sooner or later, someone else will come along. I mean, people say that uh, Betamax was better than VHS. We're, People for people much younger than us, we, they might not even know what I'm talking about. There was two types of um, video that you could watch, and then um, the, the the inferior product won out in the short term, but in the long term, DVD was superior to both of them, mm. and that won out in the long term. Mm. So the market gets it right over time. <laughs> That's the beautiful thing about it, because it allows many ideas to be tried, and the, the, the ones that are proved successful attract resources, and the people producing them are able to use those resources to expand their operations and serve more people, whereas uh, people will not tend to buy the same poor product two or three times. Yeah, that reminds me of a, you can draw an analogy of that, uh, of the free market and uh, evolution. And that various species uh, arise and perish uh, due to ability to adapt to new surroundings, new food sources, right? Change in the environment, um, and yeah, it's 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 so true that, that again, businesses rise and fall depending on different different changes in consumer demand and you know wealth. <clears throat> uh, go ahead. Yeah, they need to be responsive. The business doesn't need to go bankrupt if the. Um, producers are willing to change and, and produce what people want instead of what they think people should want. So they, they need to take their cues and then, you know, someone comes along and uh, does something maverick. You know, Henry Ford said, if I gave my customers what they wanted, I would have designed a faster horse. Well, he came something, he knew better than his customers. He, <laughs> you know, he made this automobile and, and, um, and showed them that they wanted something they didn't even need, know they needed. Right, that's a fascinating concept as well. Like, uh, like there was no demand for for a smartphone before smartphones came out, right? So how is it that 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 blew up? Um, but yeah, I, I guess those people yeah, are more like visionaries, right? They're amazing, you know. It's a miracle, and people go, "Oh, people don't spend spend too much time on their phone and and so forth." Yes, well, <laughs> you know, maybe they do. It's a bloody miracle that they have it. You know, mm. if if you were living 2000 years ago and you could turn water into wine then you might spend people you might spend a lot of time turning water into wine <laughs> you know it's because it's because the smartphones are a miracle you know they're they're incredible what you can do with something this size speak to anyone on the other side of the planet people don't appreciate what they've got oh yeah you know, the richest feudal lord in the world uh, a couple of hundred years ago would did not have the standard of living that someone who's even considered in poverty in my country would mm -hmm. live in, having a flush toilet, right. um, an oven, mm -hmm. a vacuum cleaner, mm -hmm. a dishwasher, a washing machine. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a miracle. A car. Well, the, yeah, a car. <laughs> yeah. You know? So... Oh yeah, Go, yeah no, you just yeah. It just remind me of uh, yeah, just the idea. I guess it goes back to the other video about how capitalism helps the poor. In that it's not that you know because people have this idea of the economy like it's one pie, right? So if mm -hmm. people, if some people are rich, it's because they stole from other people, right? Because there's only a pie, right? Whereas mm -hmm. really, what it is is the more businesses crop up. The more pizza pies appear, <laughs> the right, more pizza right. restaurants appear, <laughs> and right. the pie gets bigger too. <laughs> yeah, and the price of the pizzas goes down as well. <laughs> oh my gosh! Right. So in so many, in so many ways, um, you know, I saw a great video that I, I constantly uh, refer to uh, from the Learn Liberty uh, YouTube channel, and it's called um, Three Ways Sweatshops Help." Uh, help the the poor, right? Yes. Help lift people out of poverty, and it's so counterintuitive. Number one, because yes. the word sweatshop is such a a terrible misnomer. Yes. <laughs> yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, and and Benjamin Powell, a uh, famous uh, economist, 
uh, went there and saw these sweatshops and he and they on average pay three to six times the average wage of the country they're situated in. Now, the thing is, people were talking about this in the 90s when I was in school. OK, and the thing is, we didn't have access to information. It took 20 years for economists to actually go and produce the the studies. And, you know, Benjamin Powell is not one of these, um, you know, uh, hard nosed libertarians, the one that's like uh, it's all about, you know, um, my pursuit. I've got the right to pursue my own happiness, uh, which, by the way, I agree. You know, I agree. You do have the right to pursue your own happiness. He's a, a strong advocate of open borders and things like that. And he's saying, he's saying that sweatshops are a good thing. Um, you know, we just didn't have this access to information 20 years ago. It's like, it's incredible. All of the um, arguments are being systematically destroyed. I mean, we've got a show on our YouTube channel. Please check it out. It's one of our best shows. It's called Scandinavian Success, Socialism or Capitalism, where we debunk the idea that it was socialism that's made the Scandinavian countries prosperous. And we've got the wonderful Nima Sanandaji, uh, author of the book Debunking Utopia, as a guest on that show. A uh, very gracious guest, very knowledgeable, and he really helped us. So that that's pretty much the last argument that socialists have left. The, the, the only other one they've got is inequality, which is, is so fraught with problems. I mean, for one thing, how unequal a society is is no measure of how prosperous the least well-off are. I mean, when thousands of black South Africans came out of poverty in South Africa, that made it look like the inequality was worse because so, some of them, because some of them were now rich, right. but a whole bunch, you know. But instead of all of them being poor, and right. um, you know, the other thing, um, poverty is more important than inequality. But also, their solution for inequality is distribution, redistribution of wealth. Well, that's only going to take money out of investing in businesses that are creating products that are going to increase the standard of living of the poor. Uh, what you can do is remove barriers to entry, things like occupational licensing, uh, overregulation, labor laws, to help more people get into jobs where they can be trained and then they'll have more skills and then they'll be able to command a higher wage. That would be a good way to solve inequality but people always assume that the only way to uh, make society more equal is to is to tax people more no if people gain their huge sums of wealth in an illegitimate way then decouple the corporation from government and stop handing them special privileges but um, here's the thing if I'm a business owner and I've got a million pounds, you know, maybe God will bless me, uh, with a million pounds to expand my business, right? If I can get, if I project that I can get 1.2 million for investing that in improving my products and uh, advertising and things like that, then that sounds like a great um, investment. But what if I can get... Um, Two million three hundred thousand pounds. If I just lobby the government, well, then I'm not going to serve my customers. I'm going to start lobbying the the government becomes my customer. Hmm. Now check this out. According to the Sunlight Foundation, five point eight billion dollars were spent on federal lobbying and campaign contributions by America's two hundred most politically active corporations between two thousand and seven and two thousand and twelve. For every dollar they spent buying politicians, they got $741 in return. Hmm. It's hard to imagine that you'd – imagine that. Why would I even bother right. trying to improve my product right. when the best investment is lobbying? And that's not just that. Just think about all those lobbyists, lawyers, actuaries, researchers, uh, politicians, uh, all those people are doing a stupid job that shouldn't exist 
instead of making something that's going to improve someone's standard of living. It's a waste of human potential. It's a waste of resources. Oh, yeah, definitely, big time. Um, yeah, it's funny when, when people, you know, the Occupy Wall Street people, you know, they blame, um, you know, blame Wall Street or blame, you know, the big banks or uh, Monsanto even. And, and I, was, I was in that camp before I really mm-hmm. got into volunteerism and, uh, and free markets is, uh, you know, I was, I was big into nutrition. And, and mm-hmm. I, I'm an acupuncturist and Chinese herbalist, mm-hmm. so I, I looked a lot into that, Monsanto mm-hmm. and all that. And, and uh, you know, we need to ban uh, GMOs, right? <laughs> and, uh, and, and then later I, I realized, I, I learned, um, why are these corporations so powerful, right? It's not because they have a superior product. You know, it's not because yeah. they're so awesome. <laughs> like you said, it's because they engage in, um, in uh, you know, they have, they, have, they have sovereign immunity. They're, they're, they're immune to litigation. You know, if, yeah. if, if something that they produce harms you, you cannot sue them. Like, for example, Big Pharma, right? Like these uh, right. pharmaceutical companies that produce, let's say, vaccines. If they hurt somebody, they, they can't get sued. Or if GMO hurts you, you can't, you can't sue Monsanto. You know, <laughs> they, have, yeah. they have many, many protections. Yes. And they have their regulatory capture. I mean, Monsanto right. have written some of the regu- – people right. from Monsanto have written regulations for the, the food industry. People in pharmaceutical companies write some of the regulations for – you know, the, the, you've got the bankers writing the regulations for the banks. I mean, the lunatics are running the asylum. This is the world we live in. So, but people don't see that it's force, that it's the gun that's the problem, right. you know, because as soon as you've got that gun, it's a massive temptation to capture the government and pass pref- preferential legislations which suit your business. That's the way, that's the way it's always going to roll. <laughs> it, it's the ring of power from the Lord of the Rings. Hmm. No one can use that ring wisely. There's no choice but to chuck the ring of power into the fires of Mordor <laughs> and say goodbye. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's uh, that's one of the one of the best ways um, that I think we can uh, achieve or, or help people to understand what the state actually is. Is you help them to realize the gun in the room, right? You know what is a law? You know it's opinion with a gun. You know what is a tax? It's just theft, right? You they're right. not asking for your money; they take your money. <laughs> you know that's right. these are not recommendations. These are not suggestions. These are edicts and their mandates. <laughs> For sure. Yes, I cannot disagree. So I think the major um, misconception is that what we have now is capitalism or when capitalist advocates, libertarians are advocating what we have now. Now, what we have is not anything resembling a free market. Not only is everything regulated, but, you know, 30 to 40 percent of spending is spent by the government, which means they're choosing winners and losers. Mm. Um, so so you, you've you got what people do is on the left, at least, is very common. They identify problems with the current system and say, oh, it's capitalism. Uh, but they don't take into account all the factors involved. They don't draw out the cause and effect. And they use two different definitions of capitalism. Capitalism being what we have now and the free market being ideal capitalism. And they use their criticisms of the current system to attack the free market instead of drawing the cause of an effect back to its origin and uh, being a little bit more clear on what what it is there uh, is causing the abuses and you know they say when you pull up a weed you have to get all the roots because if you just cut it it will just grow right back hmm. if you don't appropriately identify cause and effects the roots of a problem you can't tackle it properly that's why they pass a regulation or a law and that causes more problems, and then you need another law to counteract those problems. <laughs> so one of the big misconceptions is what we have is some free market capitalism. No, what we have is a combination between capitalism, socialism, fascism, or if you don't like overuse of the F word, corporatism, <laughs> eh, democracy, and in some cases, either monarchy or constitutional republic. It's a complicated mix of different systems. And... Um, so it's it's irrational to define capitalism as both the market and intervention into the market at the same time. Which one is it? 
Do you know what I mean? You can't you can't have it both ways. That's mutually contradictory. Yeah, yeah. When see people say, you know, uh, you know, you know, when I don't know when there's a bailout or when there's some some kind of terrible thing that happened. You know, all these all these bankers got bailed out. They got their golden parachutes. There's capitalism. Is that what you want? You want that? <laughs> and then and, and one of the best things I think that I do is is just go to the dictionary, dictionary.com, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. Let's look up what capitalism means, the private ownership of, of uh, let's say, the production of goods and services or the private ownership of the means of production. That's it. Where's the state? Do you see any mention of the state at all? <laughs> right, 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 for sure. So when, what, when you thought, uh, oh, capitalists are just putting profit before people, uh, what, what, disavowed you of that miscon of that belief profits over people um yeah yeah that's actually that actually reminds me of uh, this peter schiff um have you seen this peter schiff video where he goes to the occupy wall street people yeah <laughs> i love that yeah and, and and goes, I, I am the one right <laughs> i love that i love that video and and one guy comes up to him he's like you know what we need we need compassionate capitalism <laughs> and then Peter's like what are you talking about capitalism is, mo- is the most compassionate system I know <laughs> it's like I'm I'm giving I'm creating um, livelihoods for hundreds of people in my business how many livelihoods are you creating how many people are you paying <laughs> none oh okay <laughs> so, that's hilarious what does the guy respond to that <laughs> I mean they, they can't really respond with much but it's just it's just ridiculous you know privates over people I mean I mean the, the way I respond is just like there's no way that a business can profit um, you know that has no ties to to you know any kind of county government state government federal government yes. without catering to the people and once they violate right. that once they once they attempt to um, how you say lie or deceive the people how quickly this reputation spread and word gets out that this guy is a crook you know people go on people sure. go on Amazon people go on uh, Yelp wherever they rate businesses and say stay away from this guy <laughs> so why would you want to destroy your own reputation by endangering or it, it, and it kind of reminds me of I have, I have a friend who has a food truck right and he's got he's constantly <clears throat> bombarded with these uh, these um, you know, agents of the state coming in from the health department, inspecting him and his truck and everything, and, and and you know, making sure he's washing his hands enough. You know, and it's like it's like who has a, who has a better incentive to make sure that his customers that the customers are not poisoned? Is it him or is it the sure. health department? <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I had a friend that said uh, he 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 was managing a pizza place, and. The regulations on checking the motorbikes for deliveries, he had to check them before every shift and and things like that. It was like, (laughs) it must be years of people's lives spent checking the same motorbike over and over and over again because they had mandatory insurance. It's crazy. Thousands, like millions of hours of people's lives where they could actually be creating stuff they're just checking the same motorbike six, you know, right. every shift, every <laughs> shift. Oh my God! I, I, I mean, I despair. And then people wonder why they're so broke ass poor and why the bloody pizza is so expensive. But I think you're hanging on a very important thing, which is a market economy permits self-interested people to prosper only by pointing their self-interests in a way that benefits others mm. so i can i could be as greedy as i want i can walk, want as much money as i want but if it's a free market the only way that i can accrue that money is by serving people by serving okay. as many people as possible so yeah maybe humans aren't inherently selfish and you can rely on them to be altruistic at times but the great thing is about uh free market is you don't need to rely on that and uh, you don't need to rely on, you know, the, what's the amazing quote from Adam Smith? It's not from the benevolence of the baker that mm. we get bread, but from his own self-interest. Personally, I, I don't know how much you know about Ayn Rand. Um, are you an enthusiast? or? No, I, actually, I've, I mean, I know a little bit about her, but I've not read any of her books. I've more been... Uh, I, uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, she wasn't the. She didn't come across as the most compassionate person, and she certainly <laughs> wasn't. But um, as a thinker, like I, um, you know, I, 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 
I agree with her view of um, the purpose of man's life, you know, that uh, which is to pursue your own happiness mm. and that, that everyone has the right to pursue their happiness, neither sacrificing themselves to others nor others to themselves. I think um, she uses the term selfishness as a non-pejorative. Mm. I think the way that she uses it um, is not most people's definition of selfishness. I think it would be more fair to say self-interest. But mm. a book called The Virtue of Self-Interest isn't as compelling as one <laughs> called The Virtue of Selfishness. Right. I agree with the Randists. Um, I agree that, uh, that man should be concerned with their own interests first. But I also agree with the humanitarians. That, and, and they say, you know, um, if you're no good to yourself, you're no good to anyone else. And... Mm. Um, you know, uh, put your own put your own gas mask, put your own oxygen mask right. on before helping the next persons. And I think that um, we've got, even though I'm a deontologist, which you know I believe in moral principles. Um, you know, don't hit people, don't take people's stuff, don't defraud people. Um, bear don't bear false witness and so forth there's a there's a very compassionate case to be made for capitalism as well a, a conse even a consequentialist case to be ma made for capitalism and uh, basically we win <laughs> on logic and <laughs> evidence and in all in all grounds whether it's because we're the ones who are principled and don't want the initiation of force between men or just because if you look at the countries that have moved towards capitalism, they're the ones where the poor are doing the best. You know, mm. um, you can you can compare Chile to um, to Cuba or Venezuela, right. or you can you can compare, say, Hong Kong, which was as poor as most African countries, to uh, Africa, the African nations in the same period. And see that Hong Kong has prospered while those nations have, have remained stagnant or they've seen some reduction in poverty. You can compare China and India pre the 90s to from the 90s onwards and see the rise in living standards there. Or you can compare the ex communist, the other ex communist countries to Estonia um, who went more towards free markets and uh, is, is, is doing very well as a consequence of that compared to other former communist countries. I mean, I think Chile is a great example because they had a fascist dictator and uh, that, you know, they, they, they recovered from, uh, from that military dictatorship in a way that communist countries don't tend to recover from communism because they, they embraced uh, free markets. And I hope they don't go back in the other direction. You know, I'm I'm still waiting for the uh, the headline, the news story of uh, you know um, poor oppressed people from uh, let's say Hong Kong or the United States f mm -hmm. illegally entering Cuba or North Korea <laughs> on, right, uh, on, right. on 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 rafts made of you know plastic bottles and shark infested sure. waters. <laughs> I never see yeah, that, it's... and I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> you know, people always fleeing. From the uh, from the places of least, um, you know, personal and economic freedom to the places of relatively more freedom, and and that's not a coincidence, as you said. You know, it's it's I think it's all about self interest and allowing people the freedom to pursue uh, their own ideals, their own passions, and their own interests. And and I really really dis uh, I, I loathe that that accusation that uh, that that um, libertarians or capitalists are just selfish you know you just want everything for mm. yourself you know <laughs> it's like it's like you know that's that's how you become yeah. a strong person that's how you prosper it's yeah. like first you got to take care of yourself make yourself stronger yeah. you want to help other people you want to have a family you got to make sure yeah. you're in good health <laughs> so. yeah yeah um you can uh if you if you if your boat's got a hole in it, you can't save anyone in your boat. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Right. Uh, and it's it's just what. Uh, sorry, I, I lost what I was going to say there. Um, you, about, please go on about your boat. No, you know, you're, we're talking about self interest and how you, you know first you have to tend to yourself, strengthen yourself, and uh, you know before you help others. Um, 
Well, I, I remember what I was going to say. Right. It's, sel- it's um, selfish or at least conceited to imagine... Well, to put your prejudices before the, the, the facts of reality or believe that you know how to run the the economy from a central point, you know? Right. You talk to people on the left, they've got all these views about the exploitative, selfish nature of capitalism and things like that. And you you know, you point out the facts about where people are actually prospering. And they say there it's more important to them, it would appear at times, that the intentions are good. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, oh, but we have good intentions when we're trying. <laughs> the communists, the socialists have good intentions. We're trying to help the poor and things like that. Yeah. That's what I meant with selfish, that idea that we're going to put our philosophy before the facts of reality. <laughs> when the facts of reality say whenever socialism is tried, you know, tens of thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people die, you know. And those who don't die are living in incredible poverty. They would, you, but the intentions are good, so that's okay <laughs> that they live in poverty. Whereas, you know, um, I, reality doesn't care about your intentions. You can take a baby and throw it out a window. Please don't, uh, uh, with the intention that it'll bounce. It's not going to bounce. It's going to die. Right? right, and if you disobey the laws of economics, if you do not adhere to them, people starve, hmm. people die, right. people get poor, people get poorer. Right. If you organize, if you allow markets to work, it's not a miracle. Right. It's not a miracle. When you allow pe- markets to work, people come out of poverty. It's proven. The argument's finished. Look at anywhere in the world. I'm sorry. I was. I'm maybe getting a bit frustrated because I had. <laughs> A couple of Facebooks. Yeah, by the way, buy my book. Uh, sorry, it's free. Download my book. <laughs> well, it's more ranting. Uh, and and uh, come come listen to the Scottish Liberty podcast because there's a lot more rants to be had <laughs> if you like these rants. <laughs> oh, no, don't <laughs> worry. Don't worry, rants. Anthony. We appreciate the passion. Uh, you know, without, without passion, it's just it's just dry and insipid. So uh, definitely yeah. the passion makes it more exciting and enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but but yeah, Hopefully yeah. We can laugh. <laughs> Say again. Hopefully we can laugh. Right, <laughs> definitely. Um, no, but definitely. So so yeah, please. Um, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up and uh, and please uh, let people know where they can uh, find your work if they want to follow your. Uh, just reiterate your, okay. your site once again. Great, thank you, thank you so much for having me on my show on your show. Sorry, I'm really tired. Just in case anyone doesn't know, it's near 3 a.m. in Scotland now, which is maybe why I was a little bit slow um, at times during the interview and must my words. No problem. Uh, please, please get my free ebook at www.anthonysamroff.com. That's A N T O N Y S A W M E R O W F. It's short, you'll like it, and it will help you save time. Uh, the other thing is check out the Scottish Liberty podcast on YouTube or on iTunes or on SoundCloud. You can listen to it on a podcasting app or or you can watch it. You can watch it on YouTube. And we usually go out on Thursdays. Um, we've gotten a lot of love for doing our show. People like it. I think we're quite funny. Uh, yeah. And uh, we, we, we also bring some perspectives that you wouldn't necessarily hear otherwise. And uh, I'd, I'd really love you to have anyone. Uh, if you strolled into my podcast from this show, please leave us a comment and let us know where you heard me. Um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, onto your podcast. Uh, I've had a really great time. No problem. No. So, so is there any way, if, 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 yeah. if people want to donate to you, do you have any, any method of Patreon or, anything, or PayPal? Yes, um, you can. Uh, right, okay. We've not really. We're about to do a fundraiser for more equipment, but it's not set up yet because we want to get better audio equipment and and stuff like that. So, if you've been so passionately moved that you would like to donate, uh, please uh, just leave a comment on one of our YouTube videos or or get me on Facebook or something like that, and I, I'll be really happy to tell you how you can do that. Uh, I know that's not, you know, on the internet where you're meant to have a direct sales funnel and be able to tell people 
<laughs> where to go at the drop of a hat. Well, um, unfortunately, I'm not quite yet equipped to do that at the moment. But um, yeah, I definitely appreciate the gesture. No problem, no problem. In time. Uh, so before you go, I'm sorry, I know you're tired. Before you go, I ask this of every guest: um, What is your favorite quote of all time? Wow. <laughs> I also get that get that you, response. You put a lot. me on the spot there. <laughs> I don't have my favorite quote of all time, but I'll tell you what my f- favorite funny quip that I said, libertarian quip. So you can quote me and meme me all over Facebook. Just remember to tag me. It's um, if socialists cared um, if socialists cared as much about poor people being poor as they care about rich people being rich. They'd be libertarians. All right. All right. I like it. (laughs) I I didn't think you were going to take it there, but okay, cool. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Actually, you know what? Let me just mention one more thing um, uh, that you reminded me of when you said that, which is um, um, some people when I, especially family members that are, that are leftists in my family, they, they, they would say to me, well, in your voluntarist or anarchist society, how would you do X? And I'm like, but it's not my society. <laughs> I'm not telling yeah. people how to act. I'm not the dictator. Yeah. That would make right. me a central planner. I don't know how people act because people have have um, you know self interest. People have goals and aspirations that I don't know about. That's the whole point of having freedom is the ability to pursue your passions, and it's not about dictating right. how other people should act. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I, 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 that's that reminds me of one of the articles on my blog. It's called something like libertarians don't have any clear plans or, or something like that because someone on Facebook said all you libertarians is just like it's vague you don't have any uh, clear plans uh-huh. and uh, uh, solid plans right, libertarians right. don't have any solid plans and I was like yeah because we're really skeptical about solid plans <laughs> like if you have a solid plan then you want to impose it upon the whole society what if your plan's wrong we don't like that. We want lots of people to have little plans, and we want to test the plans against each other, and the most uh, successful plans will be rolled out to more and more people. Uh, I'm very skeptical about people who do have solid plans. Please don't get anywhere near a government or guns and force <laughs> your solid... Don't force your solid plans on me. And I won't, I won't um, impose my solid plans on you, except for... Um, forcing you to listen to copious quantities of Scottish Liberty podcast. <laughs> That's it, the only exception. Anyway. <laughs> Wonderful conversation, right. Anthony. Thanks a lot for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so really much. Really appreciate uh, it. I, I can't thank you enough, Daniel. Um, really, really wonderful time I had. No problem, thank no you. problem. So uh, thank you everyone for listening. This is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and thus he's liberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more of it, please feel free to donate and help me interview other fascinating people. You can do so through Patreon. That's patreon.com slash peacefulanarchism to help me out. A dollar a show is all I ask. If you feel so inclined to donate more, please feel free. It will only assist me in spreading the message of freedom and volunteerism that much farther and that much more efficiently. You can also donate to my Bitcoin. My Bitcoin address is in the description to my videos as well as on my website, peacefulanarchism.com. And while you're on my site, there's a donate button to donate through PayPal. If you prefer to donate through PayPal, you can do so with that. But Patreon is a little bit easier for content creators as you can set up a recurring donation if you so desire. Also, while you're on my website, peacefulanarchism.com, please feel free to sign up, enter your email address, sign up for my newsletter, and you'll receive updates every time I post something, a video or an interview. I do not send out any spam. Or you can also follow me on Facebook under facebook.com slash peaceful anarchism or facebook.com slash Danilo Cuellar 3, I believe. Danilo Cuellar 3. So either either one of those methods, if you are able to donate, I would be most appreciative. Thank you very much for listening. 
I hope you have a magnificent day. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course, it's covered by the Bipcot No Government license. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.